So this uh, weekend, Inventors Network sent a representative to Washington, it happened to be me, um, and uh, and so that was over the weekend, August 11th and 12th. There was something called Invention Con at the USPTL. Um, the board gave me a stipend. It didn't cover all the expenses, but just give me an idea the sort of things we do with, with your dues money. And um, we, we pat, run everything by the board, and hopefully we're able to deliver something of value. Um, one is I attended uh, Invention Con, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, sponsored by the USPTL. Um, learning the resources of the Patent Office, I'll share with you some of that information today. Um, one of the big reasons um, that we did this is with, it's a national event, and there's national level speakers. Uh, people like Warren Tuttle, uh, Lewis Foreman, um, they're speaking at those events. And so my did a little elbow rubbing. So I think we're going to get Lewis Foreman, and we can get Warren Tuttle most likely. And so we're trying to be able to get those sort of speakers to come here, you know, as a result of seeing them, getting exposed to them, just letting them know that we meet. We've had them here before, um, but an event like that is very helpful in uh, helping us prospect who those sort of speakers are. Um, the other thing was, um, I don't even think I put this, put it on there, but we attended a rally for uh, patent reform. Yeah, right there, fighting and rallying for patent reform. And then um, becoming inspired, wa inspired, Washington is a great place for an inventor to spend a day or two and become inspired. So let me share with you some of that information that we had. Invention Con is a free two-day independent inventors <coughs> conference to inform and equip inventors and small businesses with intellectual property know-how. So two really concentrated days, full of programs, um, attendees had the opportunity to meet with other inventors, other successful business people, um, learn a lot about what the patent office can do um, for an inventor by taking advantage of what their services are essentially, getting patents, trademarks, copyrights, and then opportunity to network. So Invention Con um, was um, 300 people signed up. Um, the nature of it is a lot of people didn't show up, but it was still a, it was still a good invention uh, conference. The, um, one of the things, like I said, we were looking for speakers. Um, the first one on that list is Lewis Foreman. Very hard to read, but he's, he's a national level speaker. He's already been in touch with uh, me, and we're going to have him at some point in the most, in, in most likely the next six months as one of our speakers, along with others. The other thing that they spent a lot of time on is letting you know what the resources are of the patent office. They're pretty endless. We can't talk about them all in this time frame, but there's a handout we'll pass around um, to everybody in the room. Just take one. And uh, when you go home, you can uh, see what's on the patent office website and uh, go to any of these links. There's quite a bit of information available to people um, that want to learn more about that process and how they work and, and, and how to be successful on it. It covers a wide range of uh, subjects. And the conference itself was about not only patents, copyrights, legal stuff, but they also had quite a few successful inventors, um, speakers like Warren Tuttle who speaks about licensing, bringing products to market. Um, Lewis Foreman who talks about his own company, he was the founder of Edison Nation. He's done a lot of other things, but all these people figured out a way to connect their inventions to the public. And you can find that sort of stuff on the uh, US patent website as well. So then we had a little, a little fun, but on Friday we had protesters, we had press, <laughs> and we had police. So <laughs> this is out in front of the uh, US patent office. And uh, I think this video um, will give you a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. Um, give you a little background. Um, there have been some efforts to change the patent system. One of the efforts took place about six years ago. The American Events Act was actually successful in changing the patent system, not necessarily for the good. What happened was um, we learned that there really are no groups in Washington that represent the small inventor. So they went out and asked the big companies, what do they think when it comes to patent reform? And they basically put a law together that reflected that. We were completely blindsided. And then they went, uh, went to round two, and they were going to change the laws even further. 
And um, one of the things that they were going to change was unheard of in America jurisprudence was a loser pays system which only applies to patent law. So for the most part. So they were going to um, say, hey, you can come out with your invention, patent it, and then if you get sued by a very large company and you lose, you're going to pay that company's legal fees. <coughs> oh, okay. Well, chances are you're going to lose, right? Because you don't have the money to go against the big company to begin with, and they can't lose. That's the sort of thing that was going to go into law. And we had two speakers at our club, Randy and Paul, last summer. Does anybody remember them coming? Okay. I'll show you a picture of them later. They are single-handedly responsible for stopping that law. And I don't think there's anyone in Washington that can say that about any law. But these guys did. They fought City Hall, just small inventors like we all are. And uh, they pretty much staged the rally. So this was covered on BBC many places. And so this will show you what, uh, what we're talking about. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Patents are at the core of what makes America great. Today, patents are completely worthless. Inventors, over here, please. Signs, inventors, inventors, relatives, children. You are? You know, we take so many things for granted in this great nation of ours, right? One of the things we've taken so for granted is this patent system to protect the rights of the independent inventor. And that is why America has had so much innovation and has out-innovated the world. And what we're seeing now is a total destruction of that. I invented a product called the Wonder Wallet that is sold like crazy on television. Ladies, are you tired of bulky wallets crowding your purse? Introducing Wonder Wallet. We are protesting something called the PTAB, a three judge panel that can actually review and eliminate or invalidate inventors patents that were issued months and in many cases years earlier. The district court signed off on the my patent. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit signed off on moving my patents. Three judges over there took it back, and now it's worthless. The infringer got off scot-free, uh, copy of my invention. Uh, President Trump's uncle, John, was an inventor, a brilliant man, uh, who had came up with a very important invention still in use today. I believe when, uh, when Donald Trump finds out what the Patent and Trademark Office is doing, continuing Obama's policies, he's going to be very mad. My kids are here, my wife is here. They watch me pursue my dream to make life easier for them and the next generation. And what's going up in smoke? It's their future. Um, they take a lot of pride in the fact that I went out and got the patent. They brag to their friends at school about it, and I'm important to them. If this doesn't change and change soon, uh, we're never going to be able to get this economy rolling again. Okay, so um, that was a video, it looks like it's produced like a commercial, it's actually produced by BBC based on what they saw and they sent that all over the world. And it really tells the story. Now, I'm not gonna say that what you heard, I think that's a little hyperbolic that you know the patent system's ruined, the patent's worthless. Um, no, if that were the case, you wouldn't have um, patent litigation attorneys uh, willing to take cases on contingency, which they are, if they didn't felt they had any rights <coughs> at all. But the system has changed, and I'll share with you what a little bit about why and how and what and what should change. So you saw him in the video, Josh Malone. He, uh, he has eight kids, as it says. He invented this thing called the um, bunch of balloons, and it's a way to fill 100 water balloons at a time. It's a toy product, very successful. He's done very well with it. He licensed it to a company. Well, there's a company that's a, a major as seen on TV company that doesn't really work with inventors. They just look at what inventors have invented and then they figure out ways to get around their patents or whatever they need to do. And that company produced a similar product, obviously inspired by Josh's invention. And uh, Josh has been in court with them, and he went. He, you know, he's used patent attorneys the whole way, so he has a good, solid patent. 
is, is hard. It? Can't you say who it is? I mean, why can't we say who it is? What company? Telebrands or a different one? Um, you can look it up. <laughs> okay, well, give me the spelling of his name. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Josh Malone is his name, but it's it's the biggest. Let's put it that way in that business, and you know you just hate to say stuff um, okay. without hearing both sides. But you can look it up and learn more. But anyway, Josh did um, did the American Dream. He invented this wonderful product. <clears throat> did everything right. Got it to sell founded a good licensor and now he's in, been pulled into the PTAP process and the PTAP process is this three judge panel you heard talked about and they um, looked at his patents and they said well your patent should have never been issued to begin with and he was just dumbfounded he wasn't even he probably wasn't even there he was represented by attorneys and again he had attorneys write his patent and what they didn't like was, okay, who has a patent in the room? Okay, quite a few people. Does anybody in their patent use the word substantially? Instead of saying not too little, not too much. Okay, I got one that uses the word substantially. Quite a few patents do. You might not remember every word. That's the word that killed them, substantially. He, he had, in his patent, they had to explain um, how this process worked, how you would fill a water, how you would fill a balloon with water, and instead of how do you know when a balloon is full, right? We all know <laughs> when it's we know when it's completely full, it's going to burst. We when when we know it's not full enough, it's wimpy looking. So they use the word substantially to reflect that hey, substantially filled with water. The patent office, the PTAP console said we don't like that word. It's not explaining your invention enough, and that's a requirement of getting a patent. Well, he'd already been issued a patent by an examiner who had read all that. And so that's why this is so controversial, is it puts people in those positions. The, um, so let's talk a little bit about patent reform. And this is from an independent club perspective. We had um, Paul and Randy, you saw them both in the video, uh, this is Paul, this is Randy, that's Josh. And they're all here, um, not Josh, but a year ago, Paul and Randy were here. And the perspective, the perspective you hear in just a few points, what's the big deal about patent reform? Well, one, it really is a big deal. The U.S. Constitution created the Patent Office. It's in the Constitution. And to this day, only an individual can be granted a U.S. patent. Okay. Now, Apple can have an inventor working for them, and a, the inventor can assign that invention to them, but it cannot be issued in the name of Apple. If you look up inventor Apple, you, you, you search inventor name Apple, you won't get a single hit unless there's somebody inventor out there named Apple, okay? And that's, that's how it works. So you hear another term, uh, who's on the other side of this? We call them the infringer lobby. And uh, these are people, large companies in general, that seek changes in the system because they want to bar, they're being barred from using these technologies that they want to use. And the reason they're being barred, not allowed to use them, is because somebody has a patent on them. And so think about it, you're in some big Silicon Valley company that's very successful, and you're brainstorming, and you got uh, all these um, employees in the room, and they got all kinds of energy, and, oh, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this. And the attorney comes in and says, well, there's a patent on this, there's a patent on that, there's a patent on this, we're gonna have to wait 16 years. You know, or figure out how to get around it. And they're like, well, that's not good enough. We're gonna hobby, we're gonna hire some lobbyists, we're gonna go to Washington and say they shouldn't have a patent to begin with. And we're gonna change the laws to reflect that. And that's uh, more or less what's happened in some scenarios. Has anybody heard the word patent troll? Okay, you hear that a lot. Um, <coughs> basically a word that was designed by the patent infringer lobby to get the attention of your congresspeople and your senators to say there's something that needs to be changed. These patent trolls, they sound horrible. Well, there are patent trolls and they aren't trolling inventions at any greater rate than they ever have in history. It's just that the infringer lobby has said, this is a great word for us to go out and emote with and, uh, and perhaps get some of those laws changed. And when we change those laws, yeah, we'll stomp out the troll, but we'll change all these other laws, like we'll put in the loser pay system. I described earlier. So, um, who represents the um, the independent inventor? 
and can they make a difference? There's a couple of outfits, United and Veterans Association. Warren Tuttle is the president of that. He has, his, he has a day job as well. Um, U.S. inventors, Paul and Randy, and um, they're very involved in, in making a difference. And again, Paul and Randy, I don't, if they weren't here, if they weren't in Washington a year and a half ago, we'd probably be looking at this law by now. And I, I'm not kidding, because this law had passed the House by an 80 to 20 margin. It went over to the Senate, it was considered a slam dunk because everybody wanted the bipartisan effort to be successful. And these two guys start knocking on doors. And uh, Paul's got some great stories. He's going to write a book someday. He's in the elevator with Jeff Sessions. We all know who he is, right? So Jeff Sessions at the time is a U.S. Senator. And, and hardly knew Paul, but he, he knew of Paul. And as the elevator door is closing and he's leaving, Jeff says, him, you can keep your patents, which was just a four-word way to say, you've won. And that rarely happens. And, and, and that sort of thing has happened to Paul and Randy. So we owe them a big debt of gratitude. And that's one of the reasons we supported the, the rally they put on. So uh, let's talk about PTAP, why this is an issue. Um, so here's a quote. It's from Judge Randall Rader. Now, before PTAP, judges like Randall Rader decided whether patents could be invalidated or not based on a very long process, a lot of other litigation as part of it. Yeah, and this is what his quote was. PTAB is a Patent Trial and Appeals, Patent Trial and Appeals Board. That's what it stands for. It's a death panel for patents. The patents death panel is what he calls it. And um, basically what it said there is it was a board created by Obama to prevent bad patents, uh, is instead making it too easy for others to copy their inventions. Now, it's probably not fair to use the word Obama. I mean, it was a lot of things that happened, but it did happen under a bill that he signed, but it was completely supported by the U.S. Senate, which had a lot of Republicans in it at the time. But it was his administration that was responsible for administrating, administrating that. So um, let's talk about, um, okay, let me see, I think I got another slide I want to look at first. What do I do? Um, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so here we use the term, um, to prevent bad patents. When I first heard the lobbyists use that word, bad patent, it's like, you tell the inventor they got a bad patent. We think that we get this patent issued by the U.S. Patent Office that it's sacrosanct. That, that thing you can go to court with and you can prevent that other person from using your product, you're going to win. You always think you have a good patent. I didn't think there was any such thing as a bad patent. And uh, when I first heard the term, I'm like, what? I was blindsided. Well, there are such a thing as a bad patent, and here's, here's what can happen. So, a patent gives you the right to sue those that infringe on your patented idea. So if you want to go to court and sue because somebody stole your idea, you got to have a patent registered first so there's something to litigate on. In most cases, there are ways to go to court and under different sort of laws and contracts where you can do that, but for the most part, when somebody's suing somebody for stealing their idea, it's under the patent laws. And, uh, and this allows you to go to court and do that. They'll, the court will accept your file and you can get started. Okay, so, so does that mean if somebody infringes on your patent, you will win in court? And the answer to that is that depends. Because in court, your initial patent can be invalidated. So in the process of litigating this patent, um, the other side is going to say, you should have never gotten the patent to begin with, which was news to me when I got my patent. I didn't go to court, but Josh did. You saw, that was news to him, I believe. So you say, hold it, I thought the patent office issued my patent and it was rock solid. And then, uh, no, not always. And here's the analogy that I heard from somebody at the patent office that was working for the patent office, is when you think about patents, you're recording, it's very similar to real property, like the land your home is on, that gets surveyed, it gets defined, it gets detailed, and that description you take to the county, and then it gets recorded. And uh, a patent's a similar concept where you um, figure out what your invention is, what you did that nobody else did, and you say, well, I claim my invention has this and that. And then you take that to the examiner, and the examiner either agrees with you or finds other things and says, no, you can't have it, or you can have half of it, 
But in any event, they're defining some boundaries by which you can say, yeah, okay, after the process was done, the examiner said, I couldn't have that, but I can have this, okay? And so you've got this. And, and now you feel like if somebody infringes on you, you can take them to court and win. And again, not always, because the analogy here is that surveyor that would have surveyed your land that you took to the county to record could have made a mistake, okay? Now, if that surveyor made a mistake, does that mean you own the land still? No, it doesn't. It means that whoever the land really is owned by is going to be the owner of the land. So surveyors can make mistakes and examiners can make mistakes. And that's when a bad ha patent happens is the examiner has made a mistake and it happens quite a bit. It doesn't mean the examiners are bad. It's just they have a ton of stuff to consider and not a lot of time to do it in. Um, your lawyer, when you're doing a patent, wants you to be very careful that you disclose all sorts of stuff. Um, and a lot of those things can invalidate the patent as well. Anyway, so what happens then is the surveyor made a mistake. It gets refigured. Who owns the property? The examiner makes a mistake. And the property owner loses the property they thought was theirs. And the infringement suit, in the case of patents, gets, in, gets dismissed. All right, so was they moved the process from the court system, the federal court system, to the U.S. Patent Office. And they have a three-judge panel within the U.S. Patent Office. There's a case right now that's before the Supreme Court that's going to decide whether that was okay or not. Because the U.S. Patent, remember we have separations of power in this country. We have, we have the Senate representatives, the House of Representatives, Congress we call it, we have the president, the executive branch, and then we have the judicial branch. So when that was moved from the district court level, federal court level, into the uh, patent office, it moved back into the executive branch, and we feel that that is a violation of separation of powers, and that will be declared unconstitutional. It's not a slam dunk, though. We'll see. So anyway, um, that's what um, we're saying, that when you take property away from somebody, that only the judicial, judicial branch can do that, not, not some executive offices uh, run by the executive branch. So um, here's some of the problems we're seeing with PTAB. There's also something called PGR, post-grant review, which is very similar. Now that it's moved back into the patent office, the invalidation rights, right, um, rates are much, much higher. We don't have a solid figure, but some people are saying as high as 80% of the patents that go through this process their, their claims are being in, invalidated. Whereas similar circumstances in the litigation process when it was in the district court, it was more of a 20% rate. So this is very alarming. That's why we were in Washington. The, um, there's several other things getting into the weeds. There's different evidence standards. Uh, the judge at PTAB is a, basically a political appointment. As you know, we um, don't have a lot of politically appointed judges, at least they get reelected or some, but that's a problem because now it becomes um, related to political situations versus the law, it can be. And the PTAB, here's a big one, PTAB can be instituted by anyone. So if, um, if you have a patent, Mike, and I don't like the fact you have a patent, I want to be the only person who has a patent. So I go to the PTAB, Mike can't have a patent, I know him too good. And so, I go to the PTAB and I file a petition against him and Mike should have never had his patent to begin with. He can, they can do that. They can hear his case. There's no standing required, or my case. There's no standing required. That's an issue. Every, every other, in court, as you know, you just can't go to court without having a reason to be there, how it affects you. And this actually did happen. There were some um, drug companies that had some pretty good patents that were issued and uh, there were some um, sharks, I guess you'd call them, that were um, going to um, going through the PTAB process, saying we didn't like we don't like that drug company's patent. We don't think it's a good patent. We want you to validate it. And they're like, well, who are you? We're just investors. And so at the same time, they were selling the stock short, thinking they could get the patent. But the stock of that company that's publicly traded, they were going and. and quite valuable because it has this patent. They were going to court and saying, you should get that patent, or that patent should be invalidated. In some cases, it was getting invalidated, and there were fluctuations in stock prices. So that tells you how bad the situation has become. 
So um, next, uh, we're almost done here. If I can get this to move. Um, so anyway, uh, Washington, an inspiring place. This is from uh, Lincoln. Patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. That's a quote from Lincoln. You see that sort of thing when you walk around Washington. You go into the Smithsonian, and uh, there's like a whole huge floor of this um, American History Museum that's dedicated to inventions, progress, inventors, that sort of thing. This looks like something Bob sent me a picture of, right? Remember I showed it to you? But Bob, does this look like your um, studio where you invent? Something like that. Yeah, it does. <laughs> this was preserved at the Smithsonian. It's the guy that invented the video game, the first video game. Which, is there anybody in here that can tell me what the first video game was? Pawn. Pawn. Exactly. He invented Pawn. Uh, New Hampshire Company. And they preserved his studio, and it's the, probably the first thing you walk, you see when you walk into this section. So, a um, couple things to take away um, from tonight's presentation. Learn about the inventing process and all the USPTO has to offer. You don't have to go there to do it and go online and learn a lot. Uh, there's a lot of experts you can listen to. Some of the people are going to be speaking here or have spoken here. You can go listen to them again via YouTube. Uh, we have a library that has lots of books. Um, you can attend our meetings. We've got uh, speakers um, that are very topical to this. One's coming in uh, October, David Fedowa, who uh, works very closely with Stephen Key. He's one of his coaches. And then uh, patent reform. Uh, there's two websites. Um, IP Watchdog, which um, is a really good site. It's uh, patent attorneys blogging constantly about this subject. You get this, every, I get this in my mailbox every day. It, I'm going out to Washington on Friday morning. I get like a very early flight. And I get something from IP Watchdog that says our <coughs> permit has been canceled. And I'm, I'm not even on my flight yet. Our permit to protest has been canceled. That's how quick they respond. Well, it turns out that we got it figured out. So, as you saw. And then U.S. Inventor is another good website. And then, hey, go to D.C. Um, as an inventor, you know, there's lots to do there. But you don't have to, if you can't afford a plane ticket or don't have the time, you can do it virtually, too. I mean, you can, you can see a lot of what's on the Smithsonian from your uh, laptop at home. So anyway, that's, that's all I got.